and welcome to the Financial Fox TV show. Today we will be discussing food security and traceability with some great guests who have deployed the blockchain to develop new solutions for the beef industry. The project was born three years ago as a partnership between IOHK and BeefChain, a Wyoming-based traceability solution business certified by the United States Department of Agriculture. Now, probably not all of you know, but Wyoming beef producers are world-renowned for their high standard and best-in-class product, and they rarely receive the premium they deserve for their commitment to quality. This is a problem that we see in many farming and agricultural realities. Now, nowadays, health and well-being have become a main driver of the economy and the society. People want to live longer and they want to be healthier. And obviously, food is a big part of it. But one of the main concerns is the quality and the provenance of the food product. So in this episode, we are going to explore how blockchain can increase transparency and efficiency across the supply chain. It is my pleasure to welcome Jerry Fragiscatus, IOHK Chief Commer Commercial Officer, and Professor Philip Schlump, CTO at Beef Chain. Hi, guys. How are you? Great. Hello. How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. So how is the, the summer, the challenging summer? <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, I can't complain too much. I know there's a lot of people suffering across the world with COVID and so forth. I'm lucky to be in Texas where, you know, we have a nice big home and we have all the amenities that we need. And, you know, frankly, I'm still employed. Um, so I can't really complain. I'm very much more concerned about uh, the people out there that are suffering and, you know, trying to do what I can to help out. Yeah, exactly. Philip, um, so let's start to talk about uh, beef chain. So uh, it would be great maybe if you could give us some background on the Wyoming beef market and also explain the challenges faced by ranchers so we understand how the idea of beef, ch uh, beef chain came across. Well, the big thing Thing with ranches is the fact that inside the beef supply chain, and in Wyoming it's about a three billion dollar market, uh, what we've seen is that the wholesale price that ranchers get for cows has not changed appreciably since 1974. And if you think about that time between 1974 and now, what you pay for in the grocery store or at a restaurant for beef has dramatically changed. In that same time, you know, lots of these ranches have not really technologically innovated. The money is being extracted later in the supply chain by large operations um, that have control over the data. And this ends up being a non-sustainable thing. I mean, the ranches are really into things like seeing to it that their land is protected, that the environment is protected but that's not for free and they're not making a profit from it. These things are not revealed to the consumer. Um, I know a ranch that spent literally several hundred thousand dollars last year fencing off streams to prevent erosion, but that information doesn't propagate through the chain to say, you know, here's a ranch out here that's working to protect the environment, that's producing all natural uh, products, okay? But at the end, the people that benefit from that are the um, people in the middle, the middleman, or that information just gets lost in between and the consumer never sees it. And the information that consumers do see, like an all natural program, there's no real verification that on the label when it says all natural, that it really is all natural cows that went into the process. So tracking this entire process from beginning to end has been something that um, is been on the mind of a great many ranchers, but has never been a possibility until recently. A couple of years ago, we started out with our first tagged cows that were hashed to the blockchain. And one of the impediments to building a business like this is the fact that this business doesn't work in the IT timeframe. Those cows are still alive. They haven't been slaughtered yet. I mean, it's two years and this is still, you know, working through the process of getting to a final product because you're working on cow time frame, not on, on uh, you know, IT time frame of, are we releasing this year? Well, we can release, but what are we going to release? Because we don't have the data yet. So this is a slow process with a lot of different players 
Uh, in the United States, the average ranch has 42 cows. Yeah. So mostly on the ranching side, they're very small players and they don't have any collective capabilities to change what they're doing. Whereas on the, the beef slaughterhouse side, there are basically three large slaughterhouse companies in the United States and they control all of the data. There's certainly a demand for this kind of a thing. In Texas, there's a program that does uh, certified all natural milk and uh, talking to Whole Foods in Texas, they can't get enough of it and they sell it for one and a half times as much. So there's a demand for the quality product at the end, but nothing in between to guarantee the quality in between. So with a blockchain, we can actually take this, guarantee the data at every step, share the data so nobody can control and manipulate it for their own personal advantage and end up with a system that quantifiably can say, this cow was raised by this ranch. Here's the story of this ranch. It's eighth generation. It started hundreds of years ago. They have every intention of seeing to it that this ranch, you know, 40,000 acres continues on into the far future. So they're invested in the land making a good quality product and then reveal that good quality product to the end consumer. So, uh, Philip, basically you work with the ranchers directly and yes. help them to streamline the process implementing blockchain, uh, I mean, this new technology that you, uh, you are working with the IOHK, right? Yes. Okay, so maybe, Jerry, um, IHK is a partner of Beef Chain in this project and what I would like to understand is if you can explain how your technology can help them and also why IHK has decided to get involved in a project like that. Right, so you know there's two lenses to that. Obviously there's the commercial side of it which this is a business and we're looking to to make money off of a partnership but probably more fundamentally is that it supports the mission of IOHK. And what's the mission of IOHK? The mission is to empower the disempowered. It's about economic identity. It's about giving the value where the value is produced. So beyond just uh, a partnership from a business standpoint, we're very, we're very uh, supportive of the mission of Beef Chain, which is, to empower, which is to empower the ranchers. And our technology is uniquely placed to do that, right? So, I mean, the key features of our blockchain, in fact, all blockchains is probably threefold. Right? There is the decentralization of data, which eliminates intermediaries of necessity that control data and keep it, keep it hidden. There is the immutability of the blockchain, which means it's, it's proven to be true. And I think specifically in the supply chain, it's about disintermediation. It's about giving the value where, where value is produced. It's eliminating these intermediaries. It's making a flatter supply chain where everybody has access to truthful information. And ultimately you end up with a more efficient, transparent and fair supply chain, um, which provides greater trust in, in, in the brands that people, that people use to sell these products and also enhances food safety. And One thing left off there is the fact that IOHK and Cardano has the performance and the scalability to actually pull this off, which without those, I mean, we build a preliminary version of this on another blockchain. And um, instead of it working well, it had huge performance problems that just made it impractical to do. Whereas your chain makes this a reasonable possibility. It will work to do this. Yeah, that's so, an excellent point, yeah. In fact, I was thinking, I mean, you mentioned before that these realities you are working with are kind of small. I mean, uh, how about if we are looking at a bigger reality where there are thousands of uh, cattle and is that a technology or is there a system that you can deploy there as well? I mean, I could start off here. I mean, the system is created to deploy with thousands, of, in fact, probably millions of cows, right? So the system is scalable. That was the point that, yeah. that, that Phil, Phil was making. So the system we are building is scalable to millions and in fact, is, can then be expanded uh, beyond cattle. Uh, it could also be expanded to other areas of the supply chain. Uh, and ultimately we can expand globally as well, which is part of the plan in the long term. So we start with a very specific use case. We test out the product, we make sure it works properly. We make sure that it meets the success criteria and it's built in. This is one of the great things of the blockchain. 
uh, especially the Cardano blockchain, is that once you've plugged into the system, right, you get those for free. It's scalable, it's efficient, and then you get all the rest of the features that are provided as part of it, not only from IOHK, right? So IOHK is going to be one of hopefully many service providers on Cardano, but then you get access to the other service providers that are building on top of the blockchain, building other solutions, gets you into the token side of things, gets you to other, you know, great features of the blockchain that if you were to build it on a centralized IT system, you'd have to keep building a heterogeneous system on top of it that doesn't interoperate with each other, gets very messy very quickly and gets very expensive very quickly. With the blockchain and with Cardano, you get that out of the box. You get it for free, basically. Okay, let's talk a little bit about data because of, um, I think in the latest Cardano Virtual Summit, uh, Philip, you mentioned about the importance of data and how key are data in, you know, in your industry. How the, the technology that you are implementing in the business, which kind of data is giving you? How is managing those data? The most important data that needs to feed back to ranchers is really rather simple data as in when they sell a cow, uh, what's the end grading of the meat that they get for that cow? Because right now a rancher sells the cows and the only people that know what that end grading is, is gonna be the processing house. And that makes a difference of 40 to 50 cents per pound in terms of the price, sometimes more. Uh, to give you some idea, a single ranch that could add 10 cents per pound to the price of its cows would increase, and we're talking about a family ranch with 300 cows, would increase their income somewhere around 40,000 a year. That is a huge change. So that if they could get just that one piece of data fed back that, you know, their beef is coming out as USDA prime instead of USDA choice, that would be a huge factor. The second factor in the data is there are, and I do have the data to prove this, there are certain kinds of cows that sell for more for no particular reason other than the supply chain itself right now is very efficient, inefficient for cattle. And um, red Angus sell for less than black Angus because the red Angus don't look as good as the black Angus. Okay. And, you know, this is like the way uh, baseball was some years back before they actually started applying statistics to baseball and people figured out that if you actually measure it, you can figure out what wins. So those two pieces of data alone would be huge for the rancher. So getting that accurately and getting that feedback back from the very end of the chain back to the rancher so that they can make intelligent decisions on this is the kind of cows to produce, this is what I need to do to produce a better quality product. And those are not huge things data-wise. They're just really, really important critical factors. Then right. I, also, I also believe they are going to add information about the way they feed animals. Also, something that is becoming really important is not just what animals eat, but is also how they live. So kind of the well-being around, you know, around animals that can increase the, the value of the product they produce. Yes, um, we have uh, these programs the, supported by the USDA in the United States, these proof verification programs. And one of the ones that we've set up is a uh, all natural and a Wyoming plus program, primarily because the Wyoming plus is primarily because most ranches in Wyoming are open range ranches. Uh, the cows are not inside some kind of controlled facility. They're actually out being cows on the range in a good environment to grow up in. So we ought to see that the price that we get for, you know, range fed grass, natural environment, quality raised cows should be higher. And we're beginning to see that right now for the very first time coming out of some of these PVP programs. And if I may add something, yeah. one, of the, one of the other key features of Cardano is that it's a public permissionless system, right? Whereas, you know, there are competitors in the market that are using permission system, which kind of defeats the purpose to a certain extent because it still creates some level of centralization. And so this data follows the entire supply chain. Right, so that data is for the ranchers, but when it ends up at the restaurant, the restaurant can use the same data and show the consumers that it's been humanely raised, that it's ecological, um, and any other attributes they'd like to know about their beef. It gives transparency all the way down the supply chain. The, the consumer has the same access to data as the rancher, which is what flattens the, 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 
the supply chain, which is hugely, hugely beneficial to the entire supply chain. And, and I think that is leading also to the point that you mentioned before about reputation and credibility, uh, which is very important uh, for, uh, you know, for the people selling the product because, you know, they can sustain higher price, but also for consumers, they can get more confident and more, um, you know, they, they are happier basically with the product and ask more. Yes, definitely. I mean, when you go into a restaurant and you buy a steak, wouldn't you like to know that that steak came from a humanely raised, all-natural cow from, say, Camp Stool Ranch here in Wyoming? And this is the environment that the cow was raised in. That's... So explain to me a little bit more. So how is going to work the technology? So if I go and um, I think you mentioned a barcode or something, how am I going to get those kind of information? It starts out with the cow being um, tagged, probably with an RFID tag, although we do have some other systems. We track the cow at the ranch with the RFID tag. The ranches are participating in programs that are audited so that we know that, you know, if it's claiming to have some particular attribute like um, all natural, that they're not providing the wrong kind of feed because we're actually auditing the ranches themselves. Cows are shipped with those kind of tags, usually between about three or to four intermediaries after that. And eventually they're going to end up at a slaughterhouse where they go to a completely different kind of tagging system that has to do with how the slaughterhouse works internally and tracks the individual pieces of beef in the slaughterhouse through a couple different kinds of tagging systems. Usually those are barcode tagging. Uh, eventually, it ends up as a finished product with a whole set of tags relating to an individual cow and where that came from and when it was processed. And probably also we're working on some stuff having to do with things like automatic temperature measurement so that those tags are associated with when it was hanging beef. What did it meet the temperature criteria? Did it follow through every step of the way with that information? And then eventually those tags end up on the menu with a customer, you know, in a restaurant or in a retail institution where they can turn around and scan that and they can see the entire life cycle, where it came from, how it was treated, if they want to dig deep enough, you know, into the temperature measurements of when it was being processed. And I'd like to add something here. Um, so devices is key to this, IoT devices. And so just to show the level of commitment that IOHK has with, with Beef Chain, our partnership is at three levels in the state of Wyoming. We have a partnership at the state level. We have a partnership at the University of Wyoming. And we've actually funded a specific research team to work on the IoT side of, of, of the solution because we want to make it as efficient, you know, faster, cheaper, better, right? So we are, we are really committed at a very deep level to make this work for Beef Chain with our partners in the state of Wyoming. I think that can't be understated. Yeah, and I think at the point, I mean, is uh, is quite a challenge to be able to track fresh product because it's not something that you can put, uh, you know, a stamp on it. Is I think it can be very challenging for beef, but also for other products. I mean, for vegetables, for example. Yeah, this is the beautiful thing about these partnerships is that we discover these things and then we realize that it's a bigger issue than than maybe the technology or the the state of the yeah. art is today, and you know. IOHK is a very deep research oriented science driven uh, company. We go to the drawing board, we work with researchers and we, we go from first principles and we fix the problem. And this is one of the things that we're doing to make this better. And you're absolutely right. That problem has not been completely solved yet. Yeah, and also apply, I mean, for many industry, and, and I mean, I see that also Cardano is investing money in, in, uh, in finding the best way to deploy the technology as well, which, uh, you know, is, is really good because, you know, eventually you, you will have to really understand and explore all the opportunities, uh, you know, to move things in the right direction. Um, so there was uh, um, something else uh, that uh, you mentioned, Philip, you mentioned in uh, the summit, there was uh, how actually blockchain can help on the financing and trade side. So can help farmers with payments, uh, you know, to allow them maybe to not get into debt. Can you maybe explain that a little bit more? Because I think it's a very important element, uh, you know, for farmers to be more efficient and also, uh, you know, just um, 
improve their production without uh, facing a big problem that the market is, uh, you know, is just bringing up. Sure. And with ranches, you know, the, the largest section of risk and the most time that the animals are alive. And if you look at the risks distributed, this is where most of the risk is, is at the ranch either in their first season or their second season while they're still raising the animal. And the way that ranches do this is they go out and borrow money to support their ranching operation on the assumption that eventually these cows will both be alive, healthy, and sellable at a reasonable price. So they're the ones assuming the risk. Whereas downstream, there is very little risk in say a processing plant because they're, not, they're just not subject to those same kind of risks. They don't have the animal as long. It's a different kind of operation. So if you can change this to where the cows are sold and financed in a different fashion, basically creating both a marketplace for pre-sale and a, a futures market for the cows, where the cows can be sold at birth and then they become a part of the supply chain and the rancher is essentially a custodian for something, then the risk is distributed throughout the chain instead of being piled on one end. And that would be a huge change for the entire industry. It's not a simple thing to do, but one of the things that having a blockchain provides is the ability to actually change the financials underlying the entire industry and change when it's sold. Wyoming has put in specific laws to support this kind of an operation in its last session. So this is becoming a possibility and it has to start there. It has to start with legal changes that allow you to do this kind of a thing in the, the ranching industry. I mean, it's uh, great to see that, the, you know, the, the government is supporting and the university is working with you because I think, yeah, that's, a pro that's the way to go. You know, you can't try to change the world when you don't have the law coming with you. Jerry, you wanted to add anything? Yeah, I think, this comes back to plugging into the blockchain and getting all the features of the blockchain. The killer, the killer feature here is tokenization, right? Yeah. So, you know, and the data that gets put to the blockchain can be used and associated through metadata to the tokens, which provides, again, power to the rancher because they can control their data. But the other part of the puzzle, which I find very exciting, is the eco-credit side of it. Because a lot of these ranchers do, you know, do things from an ecological standpoint, and there are governments that offer credits for these types of things. You could tokenize the credits as well which creates yet another market from which the ranchers can get, can benefit from. Um, and again, back to the mission of IOHK, one of the big features of Cardano is that it's proof of stake. And proof of stake means that it's a more ecological version of the consensus than proof of work. So we also are in the game of trying to make as efficient and ecological a blockchain as possible. And again, this just dovetails so beautifully to what BeefChain is trying to do. One of our uh, partner ranches is the third largest holder of grouse credits. And we're working with the state here at the University of Wyoming to set up a system for uh, building a marketplace on Cardano to be able to trade grouse credits. The people that would like to buy grouse credits are people that are doing building and construction. And the people that have the grouse credits are people like ranchers that are going out there protecting the nesting areas of grouse. So the combination of these things works well together. And grouse grass is just one example. We have a invasive species called cheatgrass in five states that's taken over literally millions of acres. And remediation for cheatgrass is another one of these things that the ranches are heavily involved in that they would like to be able to, to you know, sell their credits after they have done it because they're trying to protect the land. Yeah, and are you, I mean, are you running any, uh, I, I believe that you, you are running some kind of training for the ranchers because I can see from one side, they, they really want to change things for their advantage, but at the same time, they might need some education, particularly in the, in the technology area. I mean, most of the, many of these ranchers won't be, you know, super techy people. <laughs> so how are you finding working with them? Is that easy? You know, what are you putting in place to help them to, um, get up to speed with the technology? Uh, I do a fair amount of work with the Wyoming Agricultural Outreach and Wyoming Agricultural uh, Station here at the University of Wyoming, specifically for doing training for the ranchers in different kinds of technology that they can employ on their ranches. 
and they're very interested. The ranchers actually are very sophisticated. They do have their problems, which hopefully some of this is going to get addressed with things like internet connectivity. And we have a ranch partner that literally, if he wants to be on the internet, he drives over on top of a hill and then he can get internet. Okay, I mean, this is not like, you know, high speed to his house. This is just to make a cell phone call. So there are problems like that that you have to address. And there's some advantages coming out of the blockchains that address these things really well and help them in some interesting ways that most people don't think about. But blockchains also provide a super reliable capability for transmitting data over unreliable networks. And that's something that a lot of people don't appreciate. But in what we're doing, it's a critical, critical capability in the long haul. Okay, so you mentioned a few projects that you are currently working on. Is there anything else uh, that you would like to add uh, um, on, uh, you know, on the topic? Um, projects that I'm working on. Last year we built IoT devices for going in a uh, meat processing plant here at the University of Wyoming for automatically tracking temperature to the blockchain. Uh, I'm also involved in the Wyoming's um, IOHK funded research lab for tracking tracking. Um, basically, it's for building things to track non-cows, um, but for using chips to be able to track and prevent fraud in other fields, which again, this is a supply chain tracking, but it's for fraud prevention. Yeah, which is a big market as well. Um... I believe, I mean, uh, we mentioned that before with the, also with the coronavirus virus that has disrupt basically um, many supply chain, but you know, the food supply chain was uh, really big disrupted. So obviously it's an opportunity for fraudster to just get in and try to sell something that is not, you know, is not the truth. Oh yeah. yeah. You've, seen, you've seen the issue with the hand sanitizers in the US, yeah. right? It's causing problems. That's an example of that, I would imagine. Yeah. Uh, we, we did some work last year with Kona Coffee, and there's, it's a single valley in Hawaii where all this coffee comes from. And the Kona Coffee Association knows that there is only $20 million worth of coffee produced. But if you look at the wholesale sales of it in the United States, it's $40 million. $20 million comes from someplace, and it's not Kona Coffee. And they'd like to be able to track that and prove that their coffee is really their coffee. I mean, the, the, Jerry, I just wanted to ask these last things to you. So, I mean, w here we are talking about reality. They don't have uh, um, any or a very little transparency across the supply chain. Um, but if we are looking at maybe smaller reality, for example, in Europe, where there is already a controlled supply chain, for example, for organic produce for milk, high quality milk. And they obviously have uh, um, manual audit. They are registering all the data even without using the blockchain, right? But everything seems that is, wor is working fine for them. How blockchain can disrupt and help those systems to be more efficient? And what value can add basically? Right, so yeah, so I, I spent 10 to 15 years living in Europe, I was living in France. So I do know that the European regulations are far more strict and you know, very rigorous from, from end to end. Um, first off, they're using legacy systems. So they still have the problem of interoperability, right? Every time you change countries, especially in the EU, everyone's using different systems. They need to talk to each other. It's very expensive. So the easy one is when you create a blockchain, you, you create this instant interoperability because it's there in the public, everyone can read it, everybody could attach to it, there's no issue of interoperability. Um, the, other part, the other side of the equation is GDPR, right? So there are legislations about you know, protecting people's data. And I, we're working also with the European Commission and their grants and so forth about complying to GDPR and the blockchain is a natural solution for this. Because um, it allows people to hold their own data, it's hashed, it's encrypted. There's a lot of features in the blockchain that we are we are getting a lot of demand in the market specifically just for that, because it just makes it easier to comply to GDPR, which is a big thing in Europe, and you know slowly will become an international mandate, if not through government, then through corporations. So those are the two easy ones um, that you can get in from, and then you get, like I said before, we need to educate. We're we're creating a new market here. This is what we're doing. We need to educate our clients that once you've plugged into the system, 
you get these other things for free. The tokenization side, it'll, it'll apply to everybody, just like it applies to beef chain. It'll, it'll apply to every, you know, agricultural business across Europe, right? Is that you will then get access to, first off, you can capture more value at the farm. I'm sure in Europe, there are still intermediaries that control a lot of the system, even if it's more controlled. Um, and then they get the features of tokenization and they can get into the, they get those features for free, which again, limits the power of central, uh, central, uh, central control like banks and financial institutions. Uh, this is going to be transformative. They already know this. All the central banks of the world are studying this. The European Commission is studying this. The IMF is studying this. They know this is happening and they're actually starting to wake up and they're coming to companies like ours to help them provide solutions for this. They, 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 they see the value. It just takes time, right? Legacy yeah. systems do not like to get disrupted. The disruption is happening. It's going to happen. The question is just when, not if. Yeah, also, okay. another, another thing that you have to look at is just simply the cost of inefficient audits. And um, about a year ago, I was out in the Washington DC talking to the USDA, specifically with their economic, uh, head of their economic division about their cost of auditing these programs. And every audit that they do right now on a ranch costs the USDA somewhere between two and $5,000 because they actually have to physically send people out to the ranch yeah. to do the audits. And if we get this to the point where it's automated, which is the way we've set up our PVP programs is to make them into automated programs, this is going to allow them to do most, if not all of that auditing, either automatically or without physically shipping people to a ranch to do it. And I, I know a ranch here in Wyoming that their auditors come out twice a year. They spend three to four days on site. They have to put the people up in a house on the ranch to do the audit. This is, that is not a cheap, cheap thing. No, and that is happening also in Europe. I mean, the audit are still, you know, physical audit. So um, when do you think we are going to see a little bit more um, concrete uh, um, realization of your project? When are you going to get, for example, automation in the audit? When, you know, uh, what's the timeline you're working on? I mean, I, I could kick this off. This is a multi-year timeline, right? And we, we're putting milestones in place and so forth. We're going to start with the lowest hanging fruit, which is providing transparency. Uh, you know, actually, from my understanding of Beef Chain, their biggest heavy lift in the earlier part of their existence was about making a more efficient audit trail and, and making less manual and so forth. That's going to take time because that requires on the ground transformation, right? You got to transform everybody to do this. That's a long process. There are things that are short, shorter term, which is just immediately providing the transparency. So more of a top down transformation. Um, and we have this on a roadmap and it's a multi-year roadmap. You know, it's gonna take time. It's not something that'll come tomorrow, um, but you, you will start seeing announcements over the next quarters about our first implementations and uh, better clarity on, on, on the roadmap moving forward. Okay, that sounds, sounds really exciting. Thank you so much for, um... Uh, joining and I look forward to see more news and uh, I also look forward to to see if I can come there and uh, you know and see the reality I think this is something that it will be good for many people uh, to actually go and see how you have changed um, you have changed a business yeah we'd love to have you come out to Wyoming and thank you, Stefania, for your time. Big fan of your show. Big fan of what you're doing. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, so this is everything from the Financial Fox today. I hope that you enjoyed the interview. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and also follow us on social media to keep up to date with our re recent news. And I will see you next time.